Hello, this is The Lost Adventurer, and on this channel we go over forgotten adventures and lost campaign settings. Today's adventure is going to be DA3, The Eye of Traldar. Released back in 1991 and written by Carl Sargent, this adventure was designed for 4-6 to six players of levels 1 or 2, and is easily droppable into pretty much any campaign as long as the player characters A. Go camping, B. You have an evil barony, and C can include a magical gem somewhere in your setting. The module is split into three separate chapters. Uh, chapter 1, Death on the Roads, which is how the whole introduction begins. Chapter 2, Below Fort Doom, which is the players sneaking into the main fort. And Chapter 3, The Tower and the Eye, which is where the final battle begins and ends. Chapter 1 begins with the players, who in the middle of either another adventure or at the beginning of an adventure, are currently camping for the night when... All of a sudden, a man on horseback with wild eyes crashes into the middle of their camp, and as his horse rears up, you know, as you get the fire and all the, the adventurers sitting there, as the horse rears up, it gets shot in the neck with an arrow. Now, once the wild-eyed rider is able to, you know, get his bearings back and stands back up, he'll look at the player characters and say, They are on us. There's no time to lose. And then your player characters will hear the sounds of, Horses closing in on the position, and some would say, kill the wretch and his friends. And that's the part where the player characters will then have the joy of fighting five thugs, a chaotic elf, and a level three fighter that actually will not get involved in the fight, and will instead run away once three of his men have been killed. The chaotic elf will also maintain distance from the party and will instead shoot a crossbow into the melee as the fight continues, and will also make his way away from the fight if things start looking bad. This entire encounter is mainly just to introduce the NPC who crashed into your camp, a second level fighter named Alexei Shalepin. After this battle is concluded, Alexei will look to the player characters and give them an entire sob story about how his entire party and group of friends has been completely and utterly murdered trying to stop these evil slavers called the Iron Ring from getting away with this thing called the Eye of Trolldar. He will ask the players to politely escort him to the nearby village of Lolm. He will offer the player characters 25 gold pieces for this escort, and he will also point out, if pressed, that Lolm is only an 8-mile hike away from here, and it's not that far, so 25 gold pieces for each player character is actually pretty good pay. The trip to Lolm is... Unexciting, there is no ambushes that are supposed to take place, and upon arrival the players will be searched by the gate guards for any sort of like heavy armor or any sort of heavy weapons like pikes and halberds and greatswords, as they are not allowed within the town, village, or city limits. Alexei will then pull out a small map of the city, and he will follow the directions onto the map to this, like, shoe repair shop. Upon entering the shoe repair shop, instead of finding the friend he was looking for, he will instead run into three thugs who are waiting for him and a magic user behind the counter. A fight begins, and as the fight continues, two more thugs from the street will come up from behind the party and from a room in the back. A level 2 fighter will also join the party, his sword already covered in blood along with his chainmail armor. This is the leader of this group of bandits slash thugs. These are more men from the Iron Ring, and once defeated, Alexei will then go to the back room that the fighter came out of, where he'll find his friend is dying on the ground. As he leans forward, the, the man on the ground will whisper with his dying breath that it was Iron Ring slavers. They knew to expect you here, and you must go to the Growling Griffin and ask for Larith. The man tries to give a little bit more information about the Eye of Traldar and its location where it's supposed to be going to, Fort Doom. But before he's able to give off the last bit of their information, his death rattle comes over and he just dies. Alexei looks over the dying old man, and, or the dead old man, uh, sheds a tear and says they killed an old man for nothing. And asks the players to accompany him to the growling griffin so he can try and make contact with this guy there and see what the next actions they should do. Excerpt here. At this point, the player characters should be, you know involved in the story beyond the original 25 gold pieces. They just saw these slavers straight up murder an old shoemaker over some nonsense. If not, the only thing the module gives the dungeon master as a way to move forward is to advise the players that they are supposed to be heroes 
And that's pretty much it. Obviously, if the players decide they don't want to be heroes and call it there, well, then this adventure's done. It's no longer their problem. This happens a couple more times, this adventure. But this is the only point I'm going to bring it, bring it up on. The advice is pretty much the same in each one of the times it's brought up. Now, back to Chapter 1. So, the players are going to be able to get to the Growling Griffin Inn pretty easily. Once they get there, they'll actually be confronted by a heavyset man wearing a, like, leather jerkin who will ask what they're doing, and then he'll finally recognize Alexi. He'll be introduced as Miranda, which is one of the friends of Alexi, and Alexi will ask him where Larith is. Miranda will point the characters down into the basement and advise them that he's down there, but he's been hurt, and the players can't stay long because the Iron Ring is looking for him. They get down there, they find Larith, and Larith is injured. He's been struck with some sort of like debilitating disease by a spell and he's waiting for somebody to come back with a cure disease scroll but he'll be able to advise the players on how to get into fort doom and how to use his connections in fact he will want the players to bring him along during this trip he will offer the player characters a sum of 50 gold pieces to bring him along and deliver him to fort doom and will also advise the players that should they refuse this offer, um, they will not have his assistance from any of the people he has inside of Fort Doom. Carl Sargent does include ways to continue on this adventure if, say, Alexi had died in one of the earlier two encounters. There will be ways for the player characters to get this far without Alexi, and he also includes another NPC that is a stand-in for Alexi, should Alexi be dead, to join the party on their adventure to Fort Doom. The way they're going to sneak into Fort Doom is pretending to be peasants. And in order to pull that off, they're going to have to get rid of all their heavy equipment and all of their heavy weapons. Because unless you're part of this evil baronies, soldiers, you are not allowed to have any of those. The player characters will be given the opportunity to buy uh, items and equipment they may need for the rest of this trip. This trip is only a measly three hours long. And there's only one real encounter on the way to Fort Doom. Once they cross the border from Lone into the Barony, there will be a set of border guards, six of them, in fact, and these six will do normal border guard things and question the player characters on what their business is and generally ask for a toll of six gold pieces. Should this go bad, there is a chance the player characters will be found out and there will be a battle here. The player characters should be encouraged by the NPCs before this happens, to, uh, you know, not go towards the whole fight everybody you can. Though, this would be a good opportunity to steal some uniforms. Once they reach Fort Doom, they'll be met at the entrance they try and use by a drunk gate sergeant who will search their, like, little wagon full of turnips, pull out a couple turnips and throw them at the player characters, but he's so drunk he misses and then just drunkenly waves them in. And now the players have gotten into Fort Doom itself. And this is truly where Chapter 2, Below Fort Doom, begins. Now, the entire plan that Larith had made up was the players are supposed to pretend to be peasants, delivering a supply of turnips to Fort Doom. The wagon they're in is actually full of turnips. He gives directions to where this Lemnox, the merchant who's supposed to be buying these turnips, is supposed to do. He's part of this internal like rebel slash spying group that's going on right now now once the players follow these directions and find lemnox the merchant uh, lemnox will not need to be told about what their mission is he will instantly go to uh, taking them to the location to meet the next person they're supposed to contact a man named Petronius. now lemnox isn't doing this out of any good part of his heart or because he's such a stalwart individual in fact, he seems to be mostly scared for his life when you guys show up. He will lead the player characters down into a sewer entrance and then down the stairs into like a archway area of the sewers, where the player characters will then get to make contact with Petronius himself. Now, Petronius is not alone. He's got two other individuals with him, so there's three people down here that meet the player characters, and nothing bad happens. There's just three dudes waiting for the player characters to show up. Petronius has a spy in the keep itself, and that spy has already told Petronius that the Eye of Traldar has arrived, and currently the main wizard of the Evil Baron is currently not there. Now, it gives the name of the Evil Wizard as Sverdlov, but history says that this is supposed to be Bargol. 
The Baron himself also is not in the keep at this time, due to him going out doing an inspection of his own armies out in the area. So if the players want to make their move, they need to make their move quick, before the Baron or the Wizard comes back. Petronius has a way to do this. He says that we can sneak in through the monster caverns underneath the castle that they usually throw prisoners into, because attacking through the front gates of the castle would be a horribly bad idea that would lead in their death. If the player characters question the viability of this plan, Petronius will point out that the inside of the keep is currently run by a bunch of people that do not want to be caught making a mistake. So if anything bad does happen in the castle, they will try and cover it up or blame someone else for the issues. Petronius will also be able to advise that though the keep's wizard is currently gone along with the baron, the wizard's apprentice, a man named Aurelian, is currently studying the orb or the eye of Traldar to be able to give a preliminary report to the wizard upon his return. And this is the part where we get into the first map that I got here. The Monster Caverns. Petronius will lead the characters to the Monster Caverns and leave them to their own devices. Uh, Lexi will still be with the player characters wanting to see this entire mission through. Or, you know, Alexi's proxy if Alexi is dead. The Monster Caverns themselves only kiss, consist of uh, 13 separate locations. Which will then lead up into the dungeons of the castle itself. One is the entrance. I don't really need to go over that. Two is a ghoul cavern that's only occupied by two ghouls. Three is populated by three skeletons and four giant rats. The giant rats will attempt to run past the player characters and will not attack unless the player characters attack them. Uh, sections four and five is occupied by a carrion crawler. Gotta fit one of those in here somewhere. Number six is uh, occupied by two zombies. Seven has a prisoner inside of it. The prisoner will be able to give uh, the location of a secret passageway down here. He's also able to tell the players how to get to the next level if they need that help, along with the other occupants in the rest of this area. The only other thing of information he has to give is he also knows that a magical item has been brought to the keep and that messengers have been sent out to retrieve the wizard and the baron to return back to the keep itself. 8 is the secret passage that I noted in the previous entry. Number 9 is the layer of a knoll. The knoll is the sole occupant of this room, and his small, tiny treasure hoard can also be found here. Number 10 is occupied by 18 giant rats that will attack the players. However, once a third of them have been killed, the dungeon master is supposed to take a morale check because they're so cowardly. Number 11 is occupied by a cave gecko and the corpse of a mostly eaten halfling with a little bit of treasure on him. Number 12 has three zombie guards inside of it, and these zombie guards have been instructed by the cleric that raised them to follow the instructions of the bugbear in the next area, and also to scream if they run into any, you know, intruders. Uh, the module has it that a zombie scream is a horrible, blood-curdling affair. And number 13 is the bugbear overseer of this entire area. He's not the only one here, either. He also has his dog with him. Once this is done with, the player characters will be able to make their way into the dungeons by using the ladder in this room. And now we're up into the actual dungeon itself of Fort Doom. Number 14 is where the player characters will appear at. However, to just even get in here, they need to bust their way in. Because the trap door that they just climbed up through from 13 is actually locked from the inside, so either a thief can try and unlock it using their normal thieving skills, or the player characters can attempt to bash it open and possibly alert the guards. If Alexei is still alive, he will be able to advise the player characters that at this point they should probably try and steal a uniform, because it will be a whole lot easier to walk around in a castle if you're at least wearing the same clothes as the soldiers inside of it. Now, once the players make their way up here, there is two separate ways to get into the actual castle itself. They can either go the obvious way, which is through section 25, which will then take you out to the keep, or there's a more sneaky way that will require the players to do a little bit of investigation, where they'll end up going to cell 18, which will not only have a invisible, like, ring of invisibility, 
But also there's a secret passage that'll take them up into the stables of the keep itself so they can sneak in that way. To even get to cell 18 to learn the secret of it, the player characters will instead have to go to cell 17, which is occupied by a level 3 fighter who happens to be the torturer of this facility. The torturer happens to be in the middle of finishing up his work on a halfling that's currently tied to a rack. After the player characters are able to defeat him, the halfling will be able to give them a small clue. He will say the end cell in stone. This will be enough to get the player characters to realize he means cell 18 and there is a stone in there that will reveal a not only a ring of invisibility but also the beginnings of a secret passage. Now the rest of the place is full of a few things. Uh, number 16 is supposedly the slop room which is where all the you know leftover food and trash is thrown. Now, this is currently also the place of a carrion crawler that used to live off of that food, but has figured out a way to, you know, climb up the walls of the refuge pit that's in here and uh, attack the first person that comes through the door. Uh, 15 is a series of cells. In those cells, the biggest one is going to be 15F, which is occupied by four prisoners who are soldiers from Lone. With enough charisma, the player characters should be able to convince them to help them in the fight. They're all level 1 fighters. 21 is occupied by a chained ogre, who actually will be willing to help the player characters for 1d3 combats in return for releasing him and giving him a little bit of food. But no matter what the player characters do, if they do release him, he will not attack them, because he's that thankful. Unless they roll double 1s on 2d6 during the, uh, you know, interaction check, or or in 5th edition terms, they roll a 1 on their d20. Number 25 is the guard room the player character will head towards if they don't figure out about cell number 18. This room is occupied by 5 soldiers and 1 watch sergeant who is a level 2 fighter. One of the soldiers, upon them being attacked in this room, will run up the stairs to summon help. If he's successful in four combat rounds, four new guards will arrive, along with the old guard, to join combat also. And after this is done, the players will be able to make their way into the keep, whether or not they show up at area 34, or if they show up at area 29, depends on what the player's choices were in the previous section. And this is where Chapter 3, The Tower in the Eye, begins. Now, it should be noted that this is not the actual fortress of Fort Doom. This is just one of the outer keeps. And the reason why it's happening in this outer keep is because this is the tower where the wizard apprentice Aurelian currently resides and works on all of his magical studies. Now, the initial objective here is to get to number 39, which is like the central tower of this small little keep. This is where the player characters will have learned that Aurelian is supposed to be studying the eye. Now, unbeknownst to the players initially, though they will be able to figure it out by A, walking up to the tower where the guard will ask them to see their pass if they're wearing a uniform. In fact, there's a decent chance he'll ask to see the pass if they're not wearing a uniform because of all the weird people that come in here. Or B, they'll be able to figure out they need this pass by interrogating one of the other guards that are currently on patrol in this keep. This pass is a, like you know, watch commander's pass that is held by the watch lieutenant of the keep. The watch lieutenant currently resides in number 38. Now, he's not exactly a scary dude. He's a level 3 fighter, but storyline has him pretty much surrendering at the first chance he can, and he just gives them the pass. After they get this pass, they'll be able to make their way into the tower where they'll have to deal with the initial guard, a slaver of the Iron Ring who is a third level thief, there is an alchemist that resides in here who counts as a level 2 magic user, and a level 3 evil cleric who happens to be the one raising all the dead in the area. Now, once they deal with all of this and they get to the top where the wizard is supposed to be, instead they'll find a level 3 fighter in there collecting all of his things. After they kill him, they'll find a note on him that says that he's currently at number 54, the watch house, with the watch captain trying to figure out what the heck to do because there's obviously something wrong inside the keep and nobody is doing anything because everything's so dysfunctional in here. Once they bust into the watch house, the player characters will get to deal with four soldiers who are level one fighters, 
Aurelian the Wizard, who is a level 3 magic user, the Watch ca Captain Tiberian, who is a level 4 fighter, and Tadoz the Slaver, who is a level 3 thief. And once they finish this all off, they will have the Eye of Traldar. And then the Dungeon Master gets to have fun creating a way for the player characters to escape this small keep, which can be done with either bribery, bluffing, or pretending to be soldiers, whichever one feels like is the most applicable for your group. The Eye of Traldar itself is a yellow-orange gem, the size of a large egg, mounted in a dragon's claw. This thing currently holds a bunch of first, second, and third levels, and is able to be used by any magic user or elf of levels 1 through 3. It suggests it be given other abilities too as time goes on as the player character increases in level and advises the players to use the up-and-coming D&D game cyclopedia, which I'm pretty sure they meant the rule cyclopedia, as it continues. Now, I glossed over certain parts of this module, but it's not really... They're not essential to the storyline. Um, there's an entire series of like five notes you can find on the corpses of some of the guards that your player characters end up killing, explaining why the guards are so dysfunctional in this keep and the reasons why they're doing everything. There's a little bit more to Alexi's storyline too that I didn't really go into, but it's not really important for what I'm doing here. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and start rating this adventure. For an adventure rating, I give this a four out of five. It's pretty fun. It's it's exciting. I mean, the player characters start off with just a boring old, you know, resting after a long trip to all of a sudden be hit by a guy running away from a bunch of thieves that leads to pretending to be peasants, sneaking into an evil castle to try and grab some magical item that's supposed to end the world. And this is designed for characters of level 1 or 2. So for that sort of introduction, this is this is a 4 out of 5. For value... This is getting a 2 out of 5. Uh, right now, the only way to get it at a semi-decent price is to pay for the digital PDF, which is currently $5. If you want a physical copy of this thing, you're going to have to get it an original. And people want $70 to $80 for this thing. And unless you're a collector, that's not really worth $70 to $80. Bucks. I mean, if it was $30, even $40 for an original copy, I might actually buy it. But $80, bucks, it's not cutting it. For deadliness, I'm going to give this a 3. It's usually pretty even. There's a bunch of ways that uh, Carl has included to make things a little bit more even by including ways to introduce more NPCs to the party to be able to take on more enemies at once. It's still deadly. It's, it's not a walk in a park. The players can't just do whatever the heck they want to and expect no repercussions. But as long as they're smart and they don't do anything too stupid, they'll be able to get through and complete this mission. Altogether, I give this about an average adventure rating of 3 out of 5. And that's it. The next video I plan on doing is Dimrak Dread, which, as far as I've heard, it's, it's not that great. But I'm still going to go ahead and do it. And I'll hope that that video, along with this one, helps somebody out there. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.